Welcome to the Airspace Business Model. Our government is a constitutional and federal government that employs a representative democracy. It supports a capitalistic economic structure that includes private ownership of the means of production, creation of goods or services for profit or income, the accumulation of capital, competitive markets, voluntary exchange, and wage labor. We can participate in managerial decisions, travel freely, buy and sell freely, hire and fire freely, organize, communicate, demonstrate, and protest freely. What we really are, however, is a mixed economy. In our economy, there are tax-funded, subsidized, or state-owned enterprises such as libraries, roads, transportation services, schools, some hospitals, some banks, mail services, communication services, water systems, legal assistance, and research and development. There is some autonomy over personal finances, but we're taxed for services like welfare for the poor, social security for the aged and infirmed, business subsidies, and mandatory insurance. In our government, we also have environmental regulation, labor regulation, consumer regulation, antitrust laws, intellectual property laws, incorporation laws, import and export controls. What part of the government did I leave out? Defense, foreign relations, and foreign intelligence. Adam Smith was a proponent of capitalism. Karl Marx is a proponent of socialism. For the most part, we've adopted a capitalistic system. Whether you're a capitalist or not, our commander-in-chief, chief executive, and head of state is a capitalist. We are customers who are part of the public sector and is such a mission focus. We hire out contractors who are part of the private sector and as such a profit focus. This creates potential conflicts of interest. This is not insurmountable, but you'll find the cultures are different and the attitudes are different. I don't know who decided to outsource the work that we do to private industry. Some agencies that are involved with what we do build satellites themselves. While you may argue that outsourcing to private companies is inefficient, it's the model that was adopted when this office was founded. This could change in the future, but for now, these private companies are our partners. The purpose of this course is to give the exposure to what motivates people within corporations so that you can better understand some of their behaviors. The companies I want to focus on are major aerospace firms. Here's a list of names, Northrop Grumman, Lockheed Martin, and Boeing, and these are the big three. Raytheon, General Dynamics, L3 Communications, Orbital Sciences, Rockwell Collins, and United Technologies. They provide tremendous support and expertise. They're f what I won't talk about is federally funded research and develop company, development companies. Their financial and business model is fundamentally different from companies in the public sector. I will also not talk about for-profit companies that provide pers personnel who support the government directly. This presentation focuses on for-profit corporations who develop hardware and software. The big three are Northrop Grumman Corporation, who operates in several main sectors. It's a leading maker of airborne systems, a designer of electronic warfare systems, makes space systems, and provides advanced information systems. It spun off its shipbuilding segment in March of 2011, and prior to that acquired Linton Industry and Newport News in 2001 and TRW in 2002. Lockheed Martin Corporation provides a broad range of products and services to the world's governments and commercial customers. Areas of concentration include space and missile systems, electronics, aeronautics, and information systems. Their program base includes the F-16, F-22, and F-35 aircraft, ballistic and other missile systems, C-130 military transport, and Titan launch vehicles. The Boeing Company is a leading manufacturer of commercial jet aircraft. It manufactures the 737, 747, 767, 777, and 787. It also produces business jets, fighters, the F-15 and F-A-18, C-17 car cargo carrier, V-22 helicopter, E-3 AWACS, E-4 command post, E-6 submarine communicator, ground transportation systems, and develops the space station. It also does work on the F-22. For you, to, for you to understand how these companies operate, we have to start with fundamental business models. We outsource to publicly held corporations whose business model is very different from a typical for-profit corporation. Next, I'll talk about the aerospace business model. It's a bit different and distinct from fundamental business model. Then I'll talk about what primarily, primarily motivates a corporation. In essence, 
is shareholder value. There are several components of shareholder value, and I'll explain them in the second part. Every company has intrinsic value, and usually there's a correlation between a company's intrinsic value and shareholder value. I'll explain some of the aspects of intrinsic value when I describe the income statement. I'll talk about the revenue breakdown. I'll talk about the corporate structure at lower levels and what I believe motivates them. I'll talk about a case study, DirecTV, and then I'll wrap up. To understand how aerospace developers operate, we first have to go over some of the basics of corporate business models. The most obvious business model is a product model. This is where a corporation will invest money, non-recurring investments, in development, will produce a product, and hopefully sell it at a profit. And here I show non-recurring product development. Companies will set a product price and spend money to produce the product. The difference between their non-recurring development costs and production costs and the product price is their profit margin. In this business model, if they produce more products, that non-recurring product development cost is amortized over a larger number of product. And amortized just means the costs are allocated to products produced. In a model like this, profit margins increase because that non-recurring product development cost is spread over a broader base. What can also happen is money is spent to develop a product, money is spent to produce the product, and then companies find ways to make the product cheaper. The non-recurring development costs are amortized over the broader base, but also because production costs have been decreased, profit margins increase. What happens more often than not, however, is market forces drive prices down, so product margins decrease, and that's what I've shown here. Products govern cycles. A phase of development is followed by product sales. In the best case, a company will capitalize on prior year sales and increase their market or market share with each successive versions. Product cycles are typically yearly. That means that a product company must be continually reinvesting in order to stay competitive. This is an example of a disruptive technology. At the start, the primary producer dominates, and at the same time, there's an upstart who enters the market. The upstart doesn't appear to be much of a threat, and so the product company continues with its typical, typical product cycle. For a, a disruptive technology, it takes over the market at some point and overwhelms the competition. There's a good book that describes this, The Innovator Dilemma, Innovator's Dilemma. In it, they talk about two examples of where companies had developed hard disk drive technology. Upstars developed smaller format hard disk drives. The primary companies were focused on their customers and introducing new features that the customers wanted, but the upstarts were making a better and faster and cheaper product. And they overcame their competition and literally put them out of business. The cycle happened again, where a new round of small format disk drive technologies were developed and those upstarts took over the market and put the second companies out of business. Suffice it to say that product development is a very competitive business. Most products that go to market don't make a profit and some of them aren't intended to make a profit. They're introduced as lost leaders. The risks are high and the payoff isn't certain. Here are examples of product companies. Mattel make to makes toys, Ford makes cars, Intel chips, and Microsoft software. The other kind of business model is a service model. Here an infrastructure is built up. This takes substantial investment and the barriers for entry are high. Startup costs for a company like DirecTV were on the order of a billion dollars. Once in place, subscribers can be signed up. So what a company will do is set a service price, spend money to sign up subscribers, and the difference between their non-recurring development costs and subscriber acquisition costs and their service price is their profit. As they gain more subscribers, they can amortize that infrastructure development cost over a broader base, and their profit margins increase. In the service business, unlike the product business, prices tend to go up, which means profit margins tend to increase. 
Service companies can innovate, but their options are limited because of the large upfront investment in the fundamental infrastructure. Smaller incremental investments offer improvements, but unlike a product company, they are much more limited. Here it's much more difficult for a disruptive technology to take over. That wasn't the case, however, with DirecTV. Large cable companies were providing the primary service and had most of the subscribers. When DirecTV entered the market, they offered a better service with better quality at a comparable price. And over time, they took away significant market share from cable companies. Examples of server com service companies are Cox Communications, Verizon Networks, AT&T, and DirecTV. Any company that you're paying a monthly fee to is likely a service company. A lesser known business model is intellectual property. Here one invents something and licenses it to others. The margins are very high because the overhead costs are minimal and upfront costs can be minimal as well. So here you spend non-recurring development, research and development money to develop an invention. You set a license fee and then you pay very minimal licensing costs to put licenses in place with companies that, that are going to use that technology. The profit margins here can be quite significant. Most companies, including the ones we work with, have small divisions who fund patent development and then license their intellectual property outside companies. This can be a very lucrative business. Here are examples of licensing firms. The Motion Picture Experts Group owns the intellectual property for video compression. The ATSC owns the intellectual property for on-air television broadcast. Coca-Cola is an interesting example. You usually think of them as a bottling company. Many years ago, they spend their bottling company operations into separate companies. They since bought back their North American bottling operation, but otherwise bottling is done separately. They've primarily licensed the formula for Coke to other and other products to bottlers. They did this to preserve the low margin part of the business in a separate company. That's why Warren Buffett was interested in buying them and still owns about 9%. I'd mentioned Microsoft as a product company, but in reality, they would be more than happy to have you download software off the, the internet and you're fundamentally paying for the end user license agreement. So in essence, Microsoft is an extremely low margin licensing company, much like these others. The other kind of business model is financial services. Some of this is a typical service model, but the vast majority of what financial service companies do is retain and invest money. They're leveraging the principle of compound interest. So they make money with money. Examples are Berkshire Hathaway, which is Warren Buffett's company, which is primarily an insurance company. He owns Geico, an insurance company, State Farm Insurance, Morgan Stanley Financial Services, and Bank of America, which is a bank. The companies we work with do some of this as well. They tend not to have significant amounts of cash on hand like these companies, but they do have a lot of people who focus on cash management, both to ensure that they're getting competitive interest rates on their debt, competitive interest rates on their cash on hand, and that their cash flow is managed well. In summary, here are the typical business models. Product model, a service model, intellectual property, financial services, and next I'll talk about the aerospace business model. This is the model that's focused on government contracting, and this is where we'll start. Let's start with the government contracting structure. Government contracts come in three forms, firm fixed price, cost plus, and time and materials. I'm not going to cover the latter because for the companies we're focused on, it's not a significant part of their business. There are four types of firm fixed price contract models. The classic one is a simple firm fixed price contract, but they can have but they can have provisions for award fee, incentive fee, or even an economic price adjustment. So on a firm fixed price contract, the award fee component is a portion of profit that is awarded by the government based on a subjective assessment and criteria that are set quarterly. Incentive fee is 
define when the contract's put in place. So it's an a priori formula, and it's a portion of profit that is paid based on incentive criteria. For a fixed price with economic price adjustment is typically something done in the commercial world, not so much in the government world, but it allows the firm fixed price to be adjusted based on a change in interest rates or other factors. There are also four types of cost plus contract models. The classic one is cost plus award fee, but can include incentive fee, fixed fee, and a fee based on cost concern, cost incurred, excuse me. This latter part is not allowed by the federal government. With cost plus, the fee pools are separate. When the contract's negotiated, the cost of the contracts are determined and a target is put in place and the fee pool is set aside separately. In a cost plus contract, if the contractor underruns, the government pays less money. If the contractor overruns, the government pays more money. Typically, with cost plus, the government must hold reserve in case there are overruns. And with firm fixed price, the contractor holds their own reserves. These contracts allocate risk to either the customer or the buyer or to the seller or the contractor. Because firm fixed price offers the most limited exposure for the customer, the, the customer bears the least risk. Going in order as the contract types change, the customer bears more risk. With cost plus fixed fee, the customer bears all the risk. On the other hand, if the contractor enter in, enters into a firm fixed price award fee contract, they're taking on a very high level of risk. Likewise, if they negotiate a cost plus fixed fee contract, they have very little financial risk. This illustrates why there's risk for one party or the other. In a firm fixed price contract, as the, the profit is whatever's left over after costs are, in, are accounted for. If the contractor overruns, they must bear the burden of the additional cost. If costs go up, their profits decrease. And if costs exceed the firm fixed price value, they incur a loss and can incur a significant loss if costs go up significantly. With cost plus, if the contractor underruns, the customer benefits. But if the contract and if the contractor comes in on costs, the customer pays those costs. If the contractor overruns, they're made whole. The customer always pays. The fear profit is set up in a separate pool. In an award or incentive fee situation, incentive fee situation, the contractor may earn no fee if they overrun, but they never face the possibility of a financial loss. We typically use cost plus contract structures when the development is very risky. If we were to ask for a firm fixed price proposal for a risky development, most contractors would decline to bid. For a firm fixed price contract, the contractor has a big incentive to lower costs because that will maximize profits. A cost plus contract is different. The incentive is to bring the costs in almost exactly at the target value and at the same time earn the maximum fee. Because the fee is separate, there is no penalty for incurring costs to the target value. The motive behind this is overhead costs, and I'll explain that later. This is fundamentally why contractors not, are not incentivized to underrun. Given these two fundamental contract types, which bottle which business model do you think applies? In the firm fixed price case, it's pretty obvious. It's a product model. In our case, a firm fixed price contract pays for a satellite product. Once delivered, we pay, and we pay a fixed amount. With a cost plus model, it's a bit more difficult to say. Ask yourself, how do these contractors get paid on a cost plus contract? The answer is they do so by filling out time cards and getting reimbursed for material costs. Most of the costs are labor. This is essentially a technical services model. This is a typical program profile. It starts with requirements development, then preliminary design, critical design, fabrication, integration and test, delivery, launch, and mission operations. Costs usually peak at the CDR time frame and then tail off. From a customer perspective, we'd like to defer any fee until we get the actual satellite delivered. From a contractor perspective, however, if they earn profits later, they must account for the time value of money. And the time value of money is quantified by this equation. 
The future value equals the present value times one plus the rate of return to the power of the number of periods. So money in the future, money in the present is worth more than money in the future. If you defer fee, the contractor is going to want more fee paid. What ends up occurring is that we, the customer, end up paying out most of the profit well before a satellite's ever launched. This also confirms that we're essentially paying for technical services. This is a typical fee profile, and contractors usually like it to mirror their program costs. One of the things that is important for them is something I'll talk about in a minute, profit margin. It's essentially the profit earned but divided by the revenue earned. If you spread the fee differently from the anticipated revenue, the profit margin will vary quarter to quarter. Fee, as you know, is not always 100%, and that's depicted by this green line. It varies from period to period. What contractor contractors are allowed to do is bill for a nominal fee, which is depicted by the red line, and this is what they report out as profits. If, after time, they have billed for more fee than they have earned, which means the green line goes below the red line, they have to give money back. If they've earned more fee than they billed, which is when the green line goes above the red line, they can bill for more. This is a legal way for them to smooth out their earnings and something that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac got in trouble for, but they're allowed to do. It used to be that the large aerospace companies we deal with favored cost plus contracts over firm fixed price. This has changed in the past five years. Northrop Grumman, as an example, earns 45% of its revenues from fur fixed price contracts and 55% from cost plus. They've taken on more risk for the opportunity to earn more profit. Other business models these contractors engaged in that I've mentioned are intellectual property and financial services. So there's really three ways they, they earn profits on contracts, by managing a patent portfolio, and by managing their money.